Hello there, it's Dr. Ominde again, and we are going to discuss the anatomy of the hip joint briefly. So, um, as usual, when you're asked to talk about a joint, you need to start by classifying the joint, state the articulating surfaces, what are the stability factors, what are the movements that occur at that joint and the muscles that cause each movement? What is the blood supply and innervation of the joint, which obeys the heel tones law and then some clinical aspects? Remember also the relations of a joint. So those are important things you need to um, consider when you are discussing a joint. So the hip joint, as uh, you all know, is formed by the articulation between the head of the femur and the acetabulum, okay? And we have various ligaments around the hips, so we are going to discuss them in detail. So how do you classify the hip joint? It's a synovial joint. Structurally, it's a synovial joint of the ball and socket variety. And functionally, it's a multi-axial joint. It allows movement in different directions. And the articulating surfaces involve a socket formed by the acetabulum and a ball formed by the head of the femur. So remember, the acetabulum is formed by the three bones that form the pelvis. That's the ilium, ischium, and the pubis. So the capsule of the hip joint proximally is attached onto the acetabular margins and the transverse acetabular ligament. Remember, the acetabular margin is not complete, so it's completed, uh, uh, it usually has a labrum that's not complete and is completed by a transverse acetabular ligament. So the distal attachment of the capsule anteriorly is on the intertrochanteric line on the femur and posteriorly is on the neck of the femur. So you need to remember that, that distally this capsule is on the intertrochanteric line anteriorly and the neck of femur posteriorly. So the distal fibers usually reflect on the femoral neck as what you call retinacular and that allows blood supply to the femoral head. So that's why that's very important. What are the stability factors? So we have the ligaments which are formed by thickened portions of the capsule. We have the capsule itself that is strong and fibrous and thick. And then we also have the congruence of the articulating surface. You have a deep socket that accommodates the head of the femur and you have muscles that form the relations of this joint. So they protect the joint and stabilize it. And you also have the fibrocartilaginous labrum around the um, the acetabulum. So we have three main ligaments of the hip joint, iliofemoral, pubofemoral, and ischiofemoral. So iliofemoral is what we call the wide ligament of Bigelow, and it's from the anterior inferior iliac spine, usually bifurcates, to insert onto the end of the trochanteric line. It's usually the strongest and therefore prevents hyperextension of the joint. It's located anteriorly, so it prevents hyperextension of the joint. Pubofemoral is from the iliopubic junction and blends with the medial capsule, where the ischiofemoral is from the ischium to the greater trochanter, so it's mainly located posteriorly. So which movements occur at the hip? Flexion, main flex of the hip, iliosoas, your MCQ, yeah? Iliosoas is the main flexor, but you also have rectus femoris. Which part of rectus femoris? Mainly the reflected head of rectus femoris. It's on the superior portion of the acetabulum. Remember, rectus femoris has two heads. Reflected head on the superior portion of acetabulum and a straight head from the anterior inferior iliac spine. Then you have the sartorius muscle and the adductors also cause some element of flexion. Extension of the joint is by gluteus maximus and the hamstring muscles in the posterior thigh. And abduction is by gluteus medius and minimus. Remember, the ones that maintain lateral balance control. Some element of abduction by sartorius, tensor fascial latter and piriformis muscle. Adduction is by adductor longus, brevis and adductor portion of adductor magnus. Remember, adductor magnus is an adductor portion and a hamstring portion. Then the pectineus and gracilis also cause adduction at the hip joint. Medial rotation is by gluteus medius and minimus, as well as tensor fascia latter. And lateral rotation are the small muscles at the back. So you have your piriformis, obturator internus, obturator externus, superior and inferior gemini, quadratus femoris, gluteus maxima. So all this cause um, lateral rotation. So again, after you've understood where these muscles are located, you'll know that anteriorly we have the iliosoas, the femoral triangle, the flow of the femoral triangle, which is iliosoas and pectineus, and the contents of femoral triangle. These are anterior relations of the hip. Laterally, you have tensor fascia lata, G minimus, and medius. Those are lateral to the hip joint. Posteriorly, you have your gluteus maximus. When you remove it, you can see your sciatic nerve. You can see your piriformis muscle. 
your obturator internus with superior and inferior gemellus above and below it and the quadratus femoris muscle. And medially, you have medial to the hip joint is the content of the pelvis, which is the pelvic viscera. Superior to the hip joint is the reflected head of rectus femoris on top of the acetabulum. And inferior, inferior to the hip joint is the obturator externus. So what is the applied anatomy? So we have what you call referred pain from the hip to the thigh and the knee. Remember, the nerves that are innervating the hip joint are also innervating muscles in the thigh and the knee joint. So you have an element of referred pain. Then there's also the spread of infection within the hip joint due to a defect in the... Then we also have posterior dislocation of the hip. The hip tends to dislocate more posteriorly because if you look at the three ligaments, the ilio uh, femoral ligament, the Y ligament of Bigelow is the strongest. So dislocation tends to occur posteriorly and mostly like as someone is seated in the car and you have head-on collision, so this posterior dislocation is more more uh, commonly occurs on a flexed hip. So then coxa vara and coxa valga, which we had talked about, when the neck shaft angle of the femur is less, is coxa vara. When it's high, it's coxa valga. Then we also have fracture of the neck and a vascular necrosis, which you need to understand that the um, head of the femur receives blood supply from a branch of obturator artery that is usually in the ligamentum teres at the head of the femur. So this artery within the ligamentum teres feeds the head and in a child, the head of the femur solely depends on this artery obturator branch within the ligamentum teres because there's an epiphyseal growth plate between the head and the neck. And remember, epiphyseal growth plate is high line, high line is a vascular, so it just gets nutrition via diffusion. So a vascular necrosis of the head of femur commonly occurs um, in adults and not in children. Because in children, when you fracture the neck of the femur, the head can still feed through the obturator branch within the ligamentum teres. In adults, the head of the femur depends mainly on the retinacular branches from the cruciate and trochanteric anastomosis that are located at the neck of the femur, the superior aspect of the femur. So when you fracture the neck, the retinacular branches rupture. So you limit blood supply to the head of the femur. The head of the femur in an adult after epiphyseal closure solely depend on retinacular branches, not the ligamentum teres uh, branch of obturator. So fracture at the neck of the femur leads to a vascular necrosis in an adult, but not in a child because the head of the femur relies on ligamentum teres uh, artery, which is from obturator artery, in a child. But in an adult, the head of the femur solely, or more uh, of its blood supplies from the retinacular branches that receive supply from the cruciate and trochanteric anastomosis. So, um, lateral balance control, which we had talked about, we said, when you stand on one limb and the other one is off the ground, the pelvis does not tilt usually. Why? Because the limb, supporting limb that is on the ground supporting the weight, the gluteus medius and minimus of that side will abduct and that will cause the pelvis to be at a horizontal position. So it doesn't sag. Okay. And therefore, the lateral balance control depends on an intact gluteus medius and minimus. So the superior gluteal vessels are intact. Superior gluteal nerve is intact to these muscles, and you need a normal neck shaft angle that's around 125 degrees, and the head of the femur must be located within the acetabulum. So you need an intact hip joint. So those are the factors that ensure lateral balance control. So what's the blood supply to the hip joint? Trochanteric and cruciate anastomosis, as we have said, mainly in adults, and in children, mainly by ligamentum teres, which has branch of obturator artery. Then innervation of the hip is will obey the Hilton's law, which states that a joint is innervated by the nerves that innervate the muscles that cause movement at that joint. Thank you.